Welcome to this lecture and we will be starting module 3 today of let's get under the hood of availability and performance management. This module is going to be about scheduling and we will cover this in four lectures. One general Linux scheduling, the other one will be normal process scheduling. This will be relevant to you to understand most of your processes that you run. Then we get to group scheduling and after that also to processes that technically are not really going to be scheduled. These are sleeping processes. So without further ado, let's get into why do we even need scheduling? So the decision is this, if you have more demand than supply, somehow you need to arbiter, you need to mediate who gets to who gets the resources. So scheduling is a problem of that mediation. When we talk about Linux scheduling, we generally will talk about the CPU resource. So assume here we have N process that need to be run. And also assume you have one CPU. Now, out of the N eligible processes, which one should get CPU time? Now, if you do decide one get CPU time, how do you not starve all the other processes? How do you make sure that important processes are not queued up behind non-important ones? And the situation can be dynamic. You could have a few processes that don't exist at time zero, but they come in later and they could be more important ones. While you're making decision on, okay, maybe I can run everybody just a little bit, how do you maximize CPU efficiency? Because CPU is a resource, the utilization of the resource is efficient only as long as people get that resource for a certain amount of time. If you're infinitely just going to be switching between every process, you will not get any work done. So we want to be efficient along the way as well. Let us look at this problem a little bit in more detail. So you have four CPUs, let us say, and you still have n number of processes. And out of those n number of processes, you first need to identify which processes are even runnable. Because not every process wants a CPU. So which ones actually do want a CPU at that moment in time, you should be able to identify. Then you should be able to, because you have more than one CPU, and assume that all CPUs are equal as far as the process is concerned, you have to be able to distribute the runnable processes across the CPUs. Then, once you have distributed, you also, if there is more than one process that is runnable on each CPU, you have to manage prioritization. Who gets to run on that CPU? And in this case, I have shown here we have five processes and process one and process two are on CPU two, uh, CPU zero. And the decision that CPU zero has made is it's moved process one in, whereas process two is still in the queue, but it's not in the CPU yet. You also need to do a periodic check on priority tasks and make sure that the priority ones are assigned to the CPU. And then what you want to do is you want to monitor load per CPU and balance them uh, across. So you have more than one CPU. You can look at the case here and see CPU three is idle and CPU zero and one have two processes that are running. So you want to first make sure before you so solve the problem for between one and prioritization between one CPU, you also want to make sure that the overall system is, is used and not that one CPU is idle and other CPUs are, are having to constantly work between prioritization of processes. So over, it, over time, when CPUs become idle, you want to move tasks between these CPUs. The kernel, to be able to come in between, intercept and make decisions has to preempt. And that the term used is preempting. Before we get into how preempting will work, there is an important detail on, on set, sort of a timer that gives back control. And that is the tick system. So the kernel tick system is a software interrupt that's called a tick. 
The tick frequency is specified in Hertz. So number of times that the software uh, timer interrupts or the number of times per second that the kernel gets back control is ticks. The Hertz value uh, is configurable at, at boot time, but generally the values that are set in Linux systems are 100, 250, or 1000. And in older systems, it was always a 100 Hertz and 100 meant 100 ticks per second. 100 ticks per second means one tick every 10 milliseconds. And a tick will mean there will be an interrupt that gives handle back to the software interrupt handler for the tick every 10 milliseconds. A 1000 Hertz system is running one tick every millisecond. Now, that means every millisecond the kernel gets back uh, through the software interrupt, the ability to manage the decisions on which process to run. A 250 Hertz system does somewhere in between 250 ticks per second, which is one tick every four milliseconds. Now, which one will your system actually run? Uh, it depends. It seems like the more modern ones are running one tick per millisecond, but ultimately the decision is how much more interactive do you want the the kernel decision making to be and how fast do you want the kernel to come in between and make changes if if less than 10 millisecond provides no value and you're better off running tasks and especially if you're running backend processes that are more efficiently just run you probably may just choose 10 milliseconds if you are running a more interactive kind of system you may want and more real time you may choose one tick per millisecond so I, I see 1000 on my system. There's another term called a Jiffy. Now a Jiffy is the time duration between two ticks. So on a 100 hertz system, one Jiffy will be 10 milliseconds and on a 1000 hertz system, one Jiffy is one millisecond. So with every tick, the kernel scheduler gets back execution control. It now has the chance to do and make changes to the execution. So when you get back control, the kernel evaluates which task should be run next. Now the choices are you can continue to run the task that you're running or you can switch to a different task. If you do switch to a different task, that will first need a context switch to happen and then you start a new task, the, the other task. The kernel also uses this time to update CPU accounting for tasks. While the kernel has control, and the kernel is always managing CPU accounting, which means which process is using how much of the CPU. So with the tick system, the kernel also manages that. So it updates CPU accounting and makes the decision on which task to run next. If there is a change, it will make a task context switch. Now, how do you know how your tick system is configured? So the config hertz boot time variable is the one that you can look at. And I did a grep on mine and in, under the slash boot con slash config files, which are being used by your process, you, you could find those values. What I see on the left side for me is that it is config hertz 1000 equals y and config hertz equals 1000. That means I am running a 1000 hertz config. One take every millisecond. On the right side is also an interesting timer that you can see within your system. If you do a cat on the slash proc slash timer list uh, file, it gives you a lot of timers that are running. One of those for every CPU is the tick sketch timer. Now the tick sketch timer is as seen here, an active timer on clock zero of CPU zero. And in the line details, you can also tell that it was started in the function HR timer start. And the process that started this timer is the swapper 00 process. And this swapper 00 is the init process at the beginning, which started the timer as it kicked off the system. So with this, I can tell uh, on, from, from the right, hey, just that's just information only. I am actually running a tick, software interrupt, and on the left, the frequency that the software interrupt will come in at. Uh, I can see how it was my system was configured at boot time. So before we get into scheduling, there is some more things to 
to understand. And one of those is process threads and tasks. So how are these different? How are these the same? Now a Linux kernel manage, manages both processes and threads as task. In fact, if you look at the internal implementation, a Linux kernel is really implementing everything that's schedulable as a task. Anything that's running is a task. Now, a process is a task, and the, and the thread is also a task uh, because of that. Because if the only if the scheduler or the kernel inside is managing everything as a, as a task, both the process and thread are tasks. Both have a PID. A PID is a process identifier, but it's not limited to processes. It's for any task. So any task has a process descriptor, and it also has a process a PID number, which gives it the distinct number that it's running at. There is no difference in scheduling between processes and threads. It's not like because one is the parent, it gets higher priority. They're all just tasks. Now a thread is a certain kind of a process and it shares some of its parents' processes resources, namely memory, locks, the file descriptors, sockets. When we are programming, we will hear the term, we need to be thread safe, thread safe programming. And the reason is because processes, when they are created by, by terminology and by how they should be, the operating system will make sure they're on separate memory spaces, separate file descriptors, separate everything, so they don't trample over each other. A thread is something that gives, uh, allows these tasks to actually have things in common. So you're not always, and that's another way to be efficient. So you're not always creating separate memory areas. So you can be more efficient by actually working on the same memory set. So a thread is a kind of a process with, with sharing going on and processes have no sharing between themselves. Other than that, they're all tasks. So when we go through scheduling, we will really be dealing with tasks, the terminology of tasks, because threads and processes will make no difference to scheduling. Now, along with that, let's get to task states. Now a task can have a few different states. The task runnable is the only state when the task is saying, hey, look, I want CPU time. Every other state says, I don't need CPU time, I'm just waiting on something or I'm doing something else. So task running is a state that a task can have when the task is ready to run or is already running on a CPU. Task interruptible is a sleeping state. And in this state, the task can actually be interrupted and can handle signals when it is interrupted through signals and do something and then go back to sleep. Uh, sometimes you want to sleep without being interrupted. Now the task uninterruptible state is meant for that. When you are sleeping and you will not be interrupted and any signals that are coming to you as interrupts, you will actually take them at the end once you come out of your sleep. And you can either come out normally because what you're waiting on has come or you could time out. But until that time, you will stay in in sleep. Uh, the task state also has a code that is a short single letter code for these states. S state stands for task interruptible, D stands for task uninterruptible, R for task running. Now the tasks can also be in states where you could be in task stopped. Now you can actually stop it process or, or a task these can be continued when you give it the signal sig continue, sig cont. A task can also be a, a be having a zombie state. Uh, the task is terminated, but it has not been cleaned up from the system yet. And that could be the Z state. So these are the task states. When it comes to scheduling or the topic of scheduling, the only relevant task then becomes are the ones that are eligible to be run. And that will be the R state, the task running state. Now let's just look at the top command output and see in my system as an example, and you can look at your own systems, what are the tasks and, and what states do they have? And you can see here that I have 134 total and two are in runnable state. 
132 are sleeping out of that. Zero are stopped, zero in zombie. And within sleeping, if I now look at the details and the column that has the S on top, I can tell that most of the, or all of the sleepings are using an S, not a D. So there, that means that the sleeping ones that I have are in task interruptible sleep. The one that has R, and in this case, in, and I've only seen, I'm only showing what's on the top of my top screen, the, the top view, uh, top is one of the running tasks right now uh, that I see, and that's row number one, PID 30387. So this is a sample of a top command, nothing to do. It just has one line here that tells you about the tasks in your system. And you can tell that only two of these are actually that are schedulable. So task switching. If tasks are running, why do you switch between tasks and how? So there are two fundamental ways to switch. One is the process yields the CPU. And you can yield the schedule to the scheduler and say, okay, I don't need to run again. And you can give it to someone else, make another priority decision. So, so the process can yield the CPU. And the other way is that the kernel preempts the running process. One is called voluntary context switch. The other one is called involuntary context switch. And involuntary is preempting. The scheduler will decide which task to execute next. And that decision is based on certain factors we will be discussing after in the next few slides. Now context switching is when you switch between tasks and context switching has a cost. Uh, it's not free. We learned in the computer systems part that you have registers, there's temporary values that the processor, the CPU has caches, level one caches for data and, and the code, level two caches, and there is a level three which is shared between CPUs. So, Whenever you change a switch a task, you have to actually take the state out of a previous task and move the new task state into the registers. You also have to uh, contend with the fact that your cache will probably be stale, that the new task will, will have to load its own memory into the cache, so it'll be a little slower to start off with. There is this warm up time. There are other uh, physical caches that also have to be flushed out and uh, and the TLB cache, which we will deal with when we get to the memory parts of the kernel also needs to be flushed. So there is a net net context switching has a cost. It is certainly not high enough that you never context switch, but it is there and and it's one of the items that the scheduler keeps in mind when it makes decisions on context switching. So now let's get to the Linux CPU scheduler. Uh, the scheduler is in itself divided into scheduler classes. And fundamentally, uh, there are two areas of the scheduler that are important, two, two high level classes. The real time scheduler, which is the topmost priority, and the normal scheduler, which is the second priority. Let's first go through the real time scheduling Real-time scheduling uh, is, by the way, by, or by how the word says, it is real-time, and you want to make sure real-time processes get CPU when they need it. Now, the tasks here are prioritized by their scheduling priority. So you can have more than one real-time process, and they're scheduled by their priority. And one is the lowest scheduling priority, and, and 99 is the highest. So if you have two tasks and one task's priority is one, the second task's priority is two, the one with scheduling priority two will run. Real time is all priority based. And, and if there is a higher priority task, real time scheduling means that high priority task will run. So the lower priority will not get CPU. Uh, and that's why the, the priorities have to be managed well in real time scheduling because you could starve the lower priority ones. There is also a scheduling policy and you have FIFO versus RR. So FIFO first in, first out, I think RR is round robin. And the difference is 
if two tasks with the same priority show up, that's the only time there is a difference between these policies. In round robin, if you have two tasks with the same scheduling priority, they both will get time on the CPU. In FIFO, the task decides when it wants to yield the process to the other one. Otherwise, the task will continue to run. So that's on real-time priority. Now, for the most part, we won't have to worry about it. It's for specific real-time processes or for certain things that are happening in the operating system. So if you're not building real-time systems, nor are you into core operating system, and that to the highest level of things that have to be real-time, it's not an area where you uh, where normal processes run. Normal is where actually the second priority after real time. So if there is no real time to be run, then you get to normal. And this and the running of normal processes is done actually according to time sharing, not according to just hard prior priorities. Uh, and time sharing means everybody gets to run. The difference is someone gets to run more, someone gets to run less. And that decision on who runs longer, who runs less, who gets more CPU time and less CPU time is decided by the task load weight. So every task gets a load weight. And if you have a bigger weight, you get to run more. If you have a smaller weight, you get to run for a lesser amount of time. Scheduling priority for normal tasks is zero. For real time, it was between one and 99, but all normal tasks have a scheduling priority zero. So it is not used at all in any decision making here. It, however, has a nice value. And the nice value can range from minus 20 to plus 19. Minus 20 is the highest weight. Now, note here that a low nice is actually good. Unlike the sketch priority where a low sketch priority was actually not good, meant lesser time. Here, a low number is actually good. You will get more CPU time. So it goes from minus 20 to plus 19. The default nice, if you don't do anything, you get a default task nice of zero in between. Uh, you, the way you use nice levels, and we will get into detail in the next lecture quite a bit on, on normal task scheduling is, is that you convert that nice level into a load weight. And that load weight then gives you, determines through a formula how long you get to run on the CPU. There are scheduling policies here, the sketch other, sketch batch, uh, and uh, sketch idle as well. Sketch other and sketch batch, there's not much of a difference, so you'll probably just run on sketch other. The, there's a small difference, and I don't really know the details internally, but batch is more effective if you're running backend server side processes that don't have to be interactive, and you just want to make sure that you give a reasonable amount of time before you preempt that task. But in general, when it'll come to normal processes and understanding scheduling decisions, you will go by sketch other, which really is the normal scheduling. And your tasks will be on sketch other. In addition to normal priority, you also within the normal priority, actually, there is also the idle uh, tasks, the idle scheduling policy. Now, you can set the scheduling policy to sketch idle. Uh, the sketch priority is still zero. And it really means idle means if there is nobody else who wants the CPU, no real time, no normal ta task with a nice value of minus 20 to plus 19, uh, no other scheduling policy, then run me. So it's pretty much looking for an empty CPU to do something. And, and that's what idle, idle policy is. It's the lowest priority. Uh, even lower than the lowest nice value on a normal process. So net-net, what we see here is we have a sketch priority that is used across processes in real time only. It has meaning 1 to 99 in the normal and idle, it is zero. There is also a scheduling policy, which, def uh, is, uh, which defines a difference in how actually tasks are scheduled internally within these categories, uh, FIFO and RR for real time, sketch other and sketch batch in the normal, as well as sketch idle when no other task is there to run in any other policy. So let us now look at how will a CPU actually use this uh, internally to, to make priority decisions. So the scheduler structure 
is where there is a run queue per run queue per CPU. So CPU zero will have its own run queue and CPU one will have its own run queue. And the run queue is a structure defined in the code and the structure for the run queue at the CPU level is struct or queue. Now within each CPU, there will be two more data structures that will define two different kinds of queues. The real time scheduler has a, has a real time run queue and the normal scheduler has a CFS run queue. So there are two separate run queues uh, for each one of those. If there is any process in the real time run queue, then that's the only one that's going to run. So the scheduling decision is done at the topmost level by the CPU level run queue. And the CPU level run queue will first check, hey, is there any real time run queue process? And if there is nothing there, it's then going to go to say, okay, there is there any CFS run queue or a normal process? Then it'll give time to the process. So, so the topmost level run queue is, is the one that is really giving the priority to the real time run queue first to make to make a call on raise their hand do you have anything to run and on the left side you could you can see that the real time run queue has one task to run on cpu 0 on cpu 1 you can see in this example that the real time run queue has nothing to run so in cpu 1 task 1 is going to run in cpu or in cpu 0 the left side cpu task 1 is going to run and on the right side cpu 1 uh, task three and task four are the only two normal tasks and they are going to timeshare on CPU one. Task two will have to just wait until task one is done just because task two is on the normal run queue and there is a real time higher priority task. There is some detail on even real time tasks do give a certain percentage of time to normal tasks and that has been put in place so if there is some runaway task and you want to bring it under control and you want to log into the server so like a five percent of the time it will still come to this normal run queue but that's not how you want to manage your own processes it's more relevant to know that if if there are runaway tasks then you are still able to bring the uh, cpu under control through some high level percentage that is set up at boot time and still gives a little bit of time to a CFS run queue task and typically to, to, to manage a real time task or maybe even you have to kill it. Now, internally, it's not that in these data structures, the tasks are in the run queues themselves, but there is another concept of a real time entity for real time queues, a sketch entity for the CFS run queues or the normal process run queues, and the tasks are connected to these entities. And the reason these entities exist is because there is some accounting, some decision making to be done in scheduling, and these entities store additional data and, and help with scheduling decisions. And that's why the task structure is not in the queue itself. So these entities exist and the entities are uh, have data for for scheduling decisions uh, connected with the task and actually the task is the one that finally gets to run on the run queue once that decision is done. Another interesting one is when nobody is there to run, if there is nobody to run on a CPU, what runs then? So there is an idle process and the idle process is not like it's using up CPU and just constantly running it. The idle process is more of, a, of an accounting construct so the CPU or the Linux kernel wants to make sure that all time is accounted for, including when nobody was running. And when you do a top command, you can see the percentage idle. The percentage idle is actually the time that this idle process was running on that CPU. And running here means that it was assigned to that CPU in the run queue, uh, it internally, uh, then accounts or provides a way for the kernel to put all idle time accounting until a task is available and then that's then the time is not accounted on idle. So it has a specific purpose, uh, but it doesn't really do anything uh, other than providing accounting information on when there was no task that needed to be run. 
Another important concept is you could be optimally running within a CPU, but you need to load balance across other CPUs because tasks are coming in dynamically, they're going away dynamically, and uh, periodically you need to make load balancing decisions of tasks between CPUs to make sure that the overall CPU is processing efficiently. So there is a load balancing algorithm that uses the total task load on a CPU plus the CPU utilization to make a decision on, hey, do I have an idle CPU here and that actually I want to move CPUs over to that idle CPU or do I have a less utilized CPU compared to a more utilized CPU and efficiently run my tasks by balancing each one of these CPUs almost equally. Now. Uh, in addition to balancing uh, from a user standpoint, you can define actually if you want some processes to run on some CPUs. This is useful if you don't want things to flip around too hard and uh, if you also want at times to have exclusive uh, rights to run on a CPU and not be pushed out by other tasks. So you could define CPU affinity for that and there's a system called Sketch Set Affinity to do that. So it is available and we will not be running through examples in scheduling, but when we go through uh, control groups as a topic, we will actually be using uh, CPU affinity examples there. The last part of this is actually, I want to show you some processes running and look at something we just learned today into a real time process, processes that are running in my system. Before that, uh, I just want to show where do where does this information come from when we want to look at process data. So the the kernel actually has a procfs uh, file system that it uh, puts, and this this is an in-memory file system that gets mounted at the slash proc directory. So it is an in-memory file system that is managed by the kernel, and the kernel puts statistics about processes that are running here. So a process specific statistic would be under slash proc slash the PID number of that process slash and then some file within that uh, folder. And as an example, slash proc slash PID slash status will have a few attributes about the overall status of the process. So you can just try it out yourself. The kernel also provides a general, not just process specific accounting, but you could get CPU info here by just going to slash proc slash CPU info. So that's gen general accounting about the kernel system that's running. It also allows you to temporarily change kernel variables for tuning. So you between reboots, of course, it will be lost, but uh, you could temporarily change and play around and see if certain tuned kernel parameters are better for what you want to try. So the proc FSL FS is an in-memory file system. There is nothing in it that stays over reboots. Kernel the way the kernel makes itself transparent, its decisions and what is going on inside of the kernel to, to pro user space tasks is through by, by keeping files and data inside of this uh, file system. So the next commands that I will look at, I'll look at top command, ps command, is actually it, uh, the commands actually go to this file system to get data because they also need to get the data from somewhere and the source for the uh, for that data is the procfs file system so let us look at the ps command here we already looked at the top command about processes so in this case i am using the ps command uh, which will give me process level data uh, and i did a filter on with using dash dash ppid which is the parent pid equals two and two is the, the the parent pid for all kernel processes so i'm filtering by only kernel processes here. And then I have uh, output on PID, parent PID, schedule, class, real-time priority, nice level, and the command itself. So these columns are I've displayed in the column legend, and these are all columns that I thought are relevant to see in context of what we are learning today. Now, as an example, let's see PID number four. And uh, what we can see for PID number four is that the scheduling uh, SCH, which is a scheduling policy, is zero and zero is uh, sketch other. On the right hand side, you have the column legend. You can tell zero means sketch other. Then the CLS is the scheduling class. 
and that is TS, which also means it's the sketch other scheduling class being used here. Uh, it is sketch other, there is no real time priority, it is normal priority. So there's a dash over there. And there is a nice value though. A nice value for this process is minus 20, which we know we learned about nice values and minus 20 means it's the highest priority of normal processes that you can have. Let us look at the next one, PID6. And PID6 is also SCH0 uh, and CLSTS, which means it's a sketch other normal process. It has a nice value of zero. Zero means it's the normal default value that is assigned to a process. And process PID number seven is actually a SCH of one, which means the scheduling policy of one equals sketch FIFO. So it's a FIFO real time process. And uh, the class is also FF, which stands for sketch FIFO. Now, the real time priority for this process is 99. Now we know that for real time sketch priority, uh, 99 is the highest priority you can have. So it'll, it'll, if it wants to run, it will get the ability to run always. And this is FIFO, which means that until it, once it is running, that until it decides to yield the CPU, it'll continue to run uh, on the CPU. And you can see here by the command that that is the migration uh, assistant and or the migration utility here. And it says slash zero, generally slash zero means it's on CPU zero. And if I have more than one CPU, I should see another migration slash one, slash two, slash three. I have four CPUs here and they are all equivalent at real time priority of 99. So now I can use see generally the other kernel tasks running here. There are some real time ones uh, that are running at real time priority of 99, the highest priority here. The watchdog is one of those, uh, migration is there. Uh, pretty much migration and watchdog are there. And then I have a few that actually are running at the highest normal priority of minus 20. And then I have a few that are at zero default normal priority. I can also look at my uh, regular user space processes. And for that I do dash dash parent pid equals one. Now we know that the parent pid of one is the system D process, which is the parent process for all, all uh, user space processes outside of the kernel, regular user space. And then I have the same output format. And just to see what's running here, a few differentiated items, I can see that uh, most of the uh, the ones that I have are CLS of TS, which is sketch other, except for one, which is running real time, 12 process ID 1281, uh, that has a real time priority of one, which means it is still not, it is the lowest real time priority. However, because it is real time, it will be, when this watchdog wants to be scheduled, it'll be scheduled in front of every other normal process here in this list. So it's still higher than anything else on this list. We also see that we have 1194 PID that has a nice value of minus four. So minus four is the lowest nice value I see here. The rest are running at default zero. Minus four will get more processor time than the other ones. And this is the audit, D, audit daemon uh, running here. So that was it for what we wanted to cover in this first level of Linux or first lecture of Linux scheduling. The next one will be a normal process scheduling where we get into more details around how the completely fair scheduler works and how they get scheduled and loads and weights uh, are managed. That's it for this one. Thank you.